Um, so let's get started. Social behavior. What are some things we covered? Milgram. Milgram. Ash. Ash. Zimbardo. Zimbardo. Attribution. Skin a little bit. Stereotyping. Stereotyping. Schema is good. Okay. So those are all the things we kind of covered. Forming impressions on others. So we saw that um, clip. Who makes more money as far as men goes? Tall men. And as far as women? Blonde women. Okay? Tall men and blonde women. As you recall, I highlighted my hair after that, but didn't make more money. All right. So uh, friendly people. So sorry, beautiful people, uh, physically attractive people. What qualities do we think they have? Honesty. Oh, no, not honesty. Not necessarily. That's a different one. Friendly, competent, and warm. Okay? What about baby-faced people? Honest. Honesty. What's the mnemonic? Babies don't lie. Babies don't lie, right? If they don't like you, you'll know. Jane Elliott's blue-eyed, brown-eyed study. So remember she um, did a little experiment kind of on her students, on her third graders, um, to show them what discrimination felt like because she felt like you don't really know how it feels unless you're in that position. So she separated them by what? Eye color. Eye color, right? The title of it. And what did she notice? Whatever it is the students perform. So one group, you know, felt superior. How did they act toward the other kids? They, they were mean, vicious. Um, they wouldn't, you know, play with them. They were calling them names like brown eye, right? Mm -hmm. And then what about their? And then what about the kids that were in the bottom group? Perform low. Perform. They perform low because they felt like they were a part of a group that was kind of no good, right? What do we call that? Stereotype threat. Stereotype threat. So they were influenced by a stereotype threat, right? Um, good. Any questions on uh, Jane Elliott's study? Okay. Social schemas. What's a schema? Preconceived idea. A preconceived idea, good. So a social schema is a preconceived idea about how people behave in a certain situation, right? So um, the whole domestic violence example, we hear of domestic violence and we automatically assume it's the? Yeah. The male, okay? Because that's what we're used to hearing. And that made us, like all those experiences that we've had and that we've heard about have, um, have basically created that schema for us, okay? Stereotyping, you judge people based on their? Membership. Membership in a group, good job. All right, before I turn, I'm testing you guys. Illusory correlation. You ever estimate the amount of times that, 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 that confirm stereotype and the ones that goes against it? Oh my God. <laughs> you, you guys didn't do your study guide, did you? <laughs> No, I know. Good job. So, you, so remember the mnemonic is like you have an illusion that you've seen a stereotype more than you have. Mm -hmm. So, you, yes, you overestimate the number of times you've seen a stereotype, and you underestimate the number of times you've seen something that contradicts it. Okay? Good. I remember for that for your response, some of them were kind of a little awkwardly worded, and it, they, they like contradicted each other. So if it ever shows up on a free response, like on the AP test, uh, make sure that you read it and it actually makes sense, okay? And if you forget the word, you know, contradict. Like sometimes we forget our words, right? Just use a word in place or just explain it. It doesn't have to be fancy, okay? All right, so there you go. <clears throat> Stereotype threat, we talked about that with Jane Elliott. So what's the definition? Try without looking. <laughs> Yeah. Good. It affects their performance. performance negatively. Okay, someone's aware of a stereotype against their group and it affects their performance negatively. Good. Yeah. Good job. Okay, prejudice versus discrimination. Which one is more a thought? Prejudice. Good. And which is an action? Discrimination. Good. Can you have prejudice? So again, a thought against someone, or a usually negative thought about someone because of their membership in a group, and then a usually negative action towards someone because of their membership in a group. Can you prejudice? 
Could you have prejudice without discrimination? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Right. Could you have both at the same time? Yeah. yeah. Can you have none? Yeah. Yes. Can you have discrimination without being prejudiced? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, for example, let's say your boss doesn't like um, people who are homosexual, and you need to hire someone, and you have nothing against people who are homosexual, but you don't hire them because you don't want to get in trouble with your boss. Right? So that would be an example. Good. <clears throat> Show me cognitive. Good. Show me affective. Good. Show me behavioral. Good. So what does cognitive mean? Yeah. Thinking. Good. What is affective? Emotion. Emotion or feeling. And what is behavioral? Action. 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 Good job, you guys. In group. Who's our in group? People we identify with. People we associate or identify with. Good. Who's our out group? People we don't associate with. People we don't associate with. Okay, does it have to be ethnicity? No. No, it could be like, if I'm a skater, which clearly I'm not, but I would, you know, would associate with the skater people, right? If I'm a dancer, I associate with the dancer people, like stuff like that, okay? But it could be ethnicity too, it could be all of Birmingham, we're kind of an in-group, right? Because we're all Birmingham. Good. So. Among our in-group, what do we notice? They're different. Differences. differences. Okay, we notice differences among people in our in-group. We tend to not confuse them for one another, right? Mm -hmm. If it's our out-group, we, see them, same. we same. see them as all the same. And we might be more likely to confuse them. You know, that doesn't mean that we're racist, but it just happens. Like when students confuse me and Ms. Wilson, right? It's, they're not, you know, and it's not their fault. Um, it's basically like an outgroup bias kind of thing. Um, okay, good. And outgroups we also view in terms of? We view them as the same and we view them in terms of negative stereotypes. Okay? So outgroups we view them in terms of negative stereotypes. Not always, but it's more likely. You're not, think about it, you're not as likely to stereotype your in group, right? Yeah. I mean, you might. <laughs> Okay. All right. What was the IAT? Uh, oh, I think it tested racism. Yes, it tested implicit racism, racism that's kind of hidden, that we're not conscious of. So that was the one where they hit one or two, and the faces flashed with a flash of light and good words and bad words, and you had to choose if the word was good or bad. And so when good words came up, and people were, you know, hitting bad because there was a black face that showed implicit racism, right? All right, attributions. So those are inferences we make, like guesses that we make about the cause of people's behavior. So if we see a homeless person and we say, oh, you know, that person is lazy, what kind of attribution am I making? Internal. Internal. And I'm blaming them for them being in that negative position. So what is it also? Fundamental attribution. Fundamental attribution error. And I'm probably doing it so I feel safer. So what is that also? Defensive attribution. Good. Is it coming back to you guys? Yeah, it's coming back. I'm like, <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. That's I am just, on fire. Like, I don't find you know particularly fun the attribution stuff, but with the mnemonics, like, not that bad. Yeah. Okay. Give me an example of an external attribution for someone slipping in the hallway, falling. The floor is slippery. Yeah, so anything that's not really their fault, like, you know, there was a banana peel on the ground, or um, someone tripped them, or, you know, anything like that would work. <clears throat> Hold on one second, I have to text my husband back. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Um, okay, fundamental attribution error. What's the mnemonic? Faye got, Faye got pregnant, pregnant because she wasn't careful. Yeah, Faye got pregnant because she wasn't careful. So Faye is in, you know, we're assuming she's in high school, which is not a good time to get pregnant. So Faye uh, is in a negative situation, and it is her fault. fault. Okay, so fundamental attribution error, when we blame someone's negative situation on them. We make an internal attribution about someone else's negative situation. 
Okay, turn to your partner, give them an example of that. So like, let's say, let's say my friend like, you go to the test, I go to the test, so it's kind of easy. She wasn't going to say that too. I read your mind. Okay, good. So someone got into a car accident, it's his fault, he was texting or something like that, yeah? Got it? Okay, good. Ashley in the guardrail. She was not careful. <laughs> Ashley in the guardrail. Yes, Ashley shouldn't have been talking on the phone while she was driving. Yeah. And it was her fault for hitting the guardrail. Inattentional blindness. Yes. Okay, self-serving <laughs> bias. That was a good one. <laughs> when you are good, when you are in the situation, so it's two parts. If you're in the situation and it's a good situation, then... We make, it we make an internal attribution. We're like, yeah, you know, I got a hundred on the final because I came to the Saturday session and I studied really hard and I worked really hard, right? And I'm smart, okay? And um, what about if I'm in? What about if you fail the final? My wife's fault. She sucks as a teacher. Um, you know, the test was too hard. The test didn't test what we went over. <laughs> Good. Okay. Don't worry. The test will be fair. I haven't made it yet, actually, but it'll be fair. <laughs> okay. So we understand self-serving bias. Yeah. Good. So weird with the microphone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we already went over this. So attribution again. We make inferences about our or other people's behaviors, right? Inferences, meaning guesses about why. Uh, like the cause of the behavior. Internal attribution is when you blame the person or their personal qualities, you might see that. And then external attribution is when you blame the environment, the environment or the situation. situation. So external is also called situational. situational. Internal is also called personal. dispositional or personal. personal, because you blame the person. Someone's disposition, that's like their character. Okay, so it's all, they're all kind of meaning the same thing, all right? Any questions so far? Okay, is the mic too loud? No. Okay. All right, actor-observer bias, this kind of covers all of them. Like, this is why self-serving bias happens. This is why fundamental attribution happens. Or, not that it's why, but it's kind of like, yeah, kind of, it's kind of why. Okay, so, if you're the actor, that means you're the person who's in the situation. In the situation. You're going to choose different attributions. So if you're the actor and it's negative, what are you going to blame? The situation. External, right? The environment. Situational. If you're the observer and you watch someone else in a negative situation, what are you going to blame? The person. You're going to blame the person. them. Okay? Yeah. Fundamental attributionary. You're going to blame internal factors. Got it? That's all actors over biases. Faye, we're, we're good, right? We could go on. Mm -hmm. Self-serving, we're good. Defensive, how is defensive different from fundamental? Safety. safety. So safety must be involved. So if something is defensive, it's always going to be fundamental attribution error. But if something is fundamental attribution error, is it always going to be defensive? No. no, only if it involves safety. safety. Okay, so if it involves a test, no, it's just fundamental, right? Assuming, you know, someone else got a bad grade, oh, that person didn't study, fundamental attribution error. That person got lung cancer because he smoked, what's that? Defensive. Defensive and fundamental because they're still in a negative situation and it's still, we're still blaming them, okay? Good. Just world phenomena, people, Deserve what, deserve what they, they get. Get, get what they deserve and deserve what they get. Okay, so that um, goes along with karma. <laughs> karma, but it goes along with fundamental attribution error and it goes along with defensive attribution, right? When people say, oh, you know, she, like, sometimes in rape cases where people sadly will say, like, oh, she was asking for it in the way that she was dressed or whatever, right? Um, so again, they're doing that to make themselves feel safer, right? So it's defensive attribution, but then they're also implying that the, she deserved what she got, which is sad, but that's just world phenomenon, okay? It could also, just world could also be a positive thing, like, oh, you know, 
when someone gets student of the month and people are like, yeah, yeah, she deserved it or he deserved it, that's just world phenomenon, okay? Is that uh, self-serving or fundamental? No. It's not, it's none of them, okay? But it is an internal attribution because we're saying they deserve it, their personal qualities. It, yes? Yes. So, so defensive is basically when you have fundamental attribution error, but it's for the purposes of making yourself feel safer. Yep. Okay. Individualistic versus collectivistic societies. What is America? Individualistic. Individualistic. Who do we put first? Ourselves, Ourselves. Ourselves above the, the rest. above the rest, above the group. In collectivistic, we put the group, the group ahead of ourselves. ourselves. Good. So individualistic, marry for love. Love. love, like Disney movies, right? Collectivistic, marry for family. family. Like, oh, this person will fit well in my family, in my community. Okay, good. Who's more likely to commit fundamental attribution error? Individualistic. Individualistic. Okay? Um, they're more likely if there's an accident to right away be like, oh, you know, that person, stupid person, they were texting, blah, blah, blah. Collectivistic might be like, oh, you know, maybe he popped a tire, maybe he had a heart attack. You know, they're not going to blame the person. Cognitive dissonance. Okay. So show me with your hands. Okay. So you have a thought, and then you have a conflicting thought. <laughs> or behavior, right? Yeah. And what does that create? Tension. tension. And what do we call the tension? Cognitive, cognitive, dissonance. cognitive dissonance. So this is the cognitive dissonance. So what do we do? We, we, resolve, it. we resolve it by changing our yeah. attitude or thoughts, right? Okay, so I stood in line for two hours at Disneyland. The ride was not very good. That creates cognitive. tension. So then you actually change your opinion. Oh, the ride was good. So that, that way it's like I stood in line two hours, but the ride was good, so it's okay. Okay, the example with the task and the um, $20 versus $1, remember they, they were asked to like file papers or do something really boring. Mm -hmm. So if they were filing papers for an hour and they only got a dollar, then that creates tension. So what do they say about the task? It, it, was oh, it, it wasn't that bad, it was entertaining. I actually like filing papers, right? <laughs> if they filed papers for an hour and then they get 20 bucks, which is like $100 today, then does that create tension? No. no. So there's no need for an attitude change. Clear? Okay. Turn to your partner, give, an, give them an example of common distance. I have to join you guys. <laughs> you want to join us? And then the other partner resolve it for them. Oh. Okay. So okay. Probably just give us one and then we'll do it. Okay. Uh, example. You want me to say mine? Yeah. Okay. But um, I have to babysit my annoying siblings. What? I have to babysit my annoying siblings. You get paid. You get paid. You get paid. <laughs> okay, good. I'm hearing some good ones. I studied really hard for a test and I failed it. <laughs> I need one of those like wireless uh, or yeah, handless. Okay, so I studied really hard for a test and I failed it. That creates tension. tension. So you could say something like, "Oh, the test doesn't matter much for my grade" or something like that. That's you know? That's <laughs> not the case with the final. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not Study hard. <laughs> okay. Anyone else want to give an example of cognitive dissonance and the resolution? Oh, yes. Okay. So I ate a donut. It has a lot of calories, but it was really good, so it was worth it. Or, you know, I, I need the sugar to keep me awake during my review session. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, good job. Dissonance theory, this is just the same kind of thing. So this um, is the study that explained um, like cognitive dissonance with the filing of the dollar versus 20. Um, effort justification, this is kind of like why cognitive dissonance occurs. Um, because you want to be able to justify your effort. Like if you stood in line at Disneyland for two hours, 
but it wasn't a good ride, you want to justify standing in line. So, you're, so you say or you make yourself believe it was a good ride. You're not lying. You're, you're literally making yourself believe that. So that, you're, so that the effort, <laughs> so that the effort of standing in line for two hours was worth it. You understand? Mm -hmm. Effort justification, it goes with cognitive dissonance, okay? It's kind of similar, same thing. Okay, uh, I actually had a student from two years ago who's um, studying engineering at Cal Poly Pomona right now, texted me yesterday, um, because she and her boyfriend, who's also in my class, were like arguing about the UNO activity. <laughs> like, I guess they had some, they have flashbacks to AP Psych sometimes. And so she was like, you know, well, what were the rules again? And <laughs> just like randomly. All right, so remember the UNO activity? Yes. With the numbers? What did we notice? You try to miss. High numbers went to High numbers ended up with higher numbers. Lower numbers ended up with lower numbers. This proves the matching hypothesis. Matching hypothesis. So the matching hypothesis is the idea that people of the same what attractiveness. Attractiveness. physical attractiveness level end up together romantically. Okay. So pretty people end up with pretty people. I'm not going to do the rest. Of it. <laughs> Um, obviously, there are you know exceptions like Hugh Hefner and you know the playmates and stuff like that. But um, you know that's that kind of proves the whole other like evolutionary reasoning behind what women go for and what men go for, which we're going to get into shortly. Okay. Any questions? Do opposites attract? No. no. No, not really. We tend to go with people who are similar in hobbies, too. Okay? All right. Passionate versus companionate love. What's passionate love? Sexual feelings. Right. Like, related to sex and lust and stuff like that. What's companionate love? Trust. Friendship. What word in there shows you that? Companion. Companion. If they put compassionate love on the test, what? No, no, no. no, it's wrong. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, compa compassionate love is not one of those things. I mean, it's, you know, you could have compassionate love for people, but it's not a psych term, okay? Um, what do you call when you have both passionate and companionate? Consuming. Consummate love. What's the word in there? Sum. Sum. Like a sum of both of them together. Good. Okay. Do they always coexist? No. 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 Which is higher in the beginning? Passionate. Passionate. Good. And which is higher later? Companion. Good. Okay. Attachment. So Hazen and Shaver, they did a study where they compared infants uh, attachment styles to their caregiver to adults attachment styles to their partner, partner romantic partner. And what did they notice? They were pretty similar, right? So how you were attached to your caregiver as a baby predicted how you were attached to your partner as an adult. adult. Is there a cause and effect relationship there? No. no, we don't know, right? But it's it's purely what? Correlational. Correlational. So we have predictability there, but we don't have cause and effect, okay? Does it mean for sure that if you were anxious and ambivalent as a baby, like you're screwed in adulthood? No. no. Okay, so whenever I go over that, I see worried looks on people's faces. Um, don't worry. All right, so good. So the three types, when the babies were attached appropriately, and remember the uh, strange situation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mary Ainsworth's study. So when the mom left the room, the baby would cry, cry right. which is normal. But then the mom came back, and the baby would stop, stop, crying. stop crying. They would calm down. What do we call that? One? Secure. 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 Good. And as an adult, they were? Secure. They were they were not worried. Yeah, they were, they were trusting and, you know, like appropriate, right? Like a good, solid kind of relationship, generally. Um, and anxious, ambivalent, how were they as a baby? Cry, cry, cry when the mom left. And cry, and cry, cry, cry when the mom came back. Like, how dare you leave me, mama, right? <laughs> okay, and then as adults, how were they? They were untrusting. They were distrusting. Is it distrusting? Mistrust? Mistrusting, I think. Um, 
and they would always think that the person was cheating, cheating and they were jealous and there were a lot of highs and lows, right? They were, it's volatile is a word you'll see on the AP test, volatile, like explosive kind of. Um, okay, good, and they would fall in love quickly, right? Perfect candidate for The Bachelor, okay? <laughs> it's true, uh, good. And then um, the avoidant attachment, how are they as babies? They didn't, they didn't, they didn't really care when the mom left or came back. Okay, and then as adults, they, they're uncomfortable. They don't really attach, right? They um, hard to get close to, basically. Whereas anxious ambivalent is like get close too fast. Okay, who's most likely to have sex to keep a partner? Anxious ambivalent. Good. And who's most likely to have many sexual partners? Avoidant. Good. Why? Because, because they, they don't, don't get attached. attached. Because they don't. There's no attachment there, so it's like just a physical thing without any emotional attachment. Any questions? No. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, individualistic versus. Oh, we went over that. Let's get it. Okay. So, why do we like attractive people? What does attraction kind of signify? Health. 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 Good. And so, facial symmetry, right? That's something that signifies health. For women, do you remember the waist to hip ratio? Point seven. Point seven, because what does that indicate? Hourglass, but something that starts with an F. Fertility. Fertility, good. Okay, so men are concerned with spreading their seed. Women are concerned with resources. So men place more emphasis on looks, physical appearance, Women place more emphasis on social status, something that starts with an A, ambition, okay, things related to money or future money, <laughs> okay, good. Women's menstrual cycles, when are they most fertile? Before ovulation. Just before ovulation, okay, um, when are, <laughs> stripper study, when are strippers most likely to get high tips? right around that time, okay? And again, it's correlational, so we don't know if the strippers are coming on to the men more, or if so, there's some kind of pheromone being released and the men are more attracted to them. It's probably a combination of the two. Man, I wish I had that clicker. <laughs> okay, deception. Women lie, or sorry, women get upset when men lie about money. money. Good, money. And Men get upset when women lie about promiscuity, which means how many sexual partners they've had, okay? Remember that question I asked the class that I told you they asked in my human sexuality class? And um, remember I told you guys that? Oh yeah, when they have to raise their hands. Yeah, when you raised your hands. So the question was, what would make you, remember I asked guys and girls separately, what would make you more upset if your boyfriend or girlfriend physically cheated on you or if they fell, fell in love, love with someone else. And so in general, women get more upset if they fall in love because there goes their resources, right? <laughs> Men get more upset if, if, women lie, if women cheat because they don't know if the baby is theirs. Okay, so they might be like wasting you know, their resources is, is the idea of it. You're not the father. <laughs> All right, attraction. The more you see someone, the more you like them. What is that? Reciprocity. Mere exposure oh. effect. Think exposure, right? You're exposed. So I, I told one of the classes this pickup line. Uh, I can't. I think it was fourth. Um, so here's another pickup line you guys can use. Um, did the mere exposure effect kick kick in yet, or do I have to walk by again? <laughs> I didn't make it up. I wish I did. All right. Reciprocity effect? We like those we like who like us back. We like those who like us back. So you might have no interest in someone, but then you feel like they like you, and so you might start liking them back. Okay? Possibly. I'm forced to like them back. <laughs> or you run away. I'm like, close your door. Okay. <laughs> Once again, show me cognitive. Show me affective. Show me behavioral. Very good.
I T, we already covered. What's your explicit attitude? You're aware of the attitudes you're aware of. I think X ex, exit X ex kind of means outside, like exoskeleton. But you could think exit, like you can exit with it. You can say the attitude. Implicit, like in inside. So it's the attitude you're not aware. Of. Not aware. Good. Uh, we also so the IAT we showed implicit racism. Also PET scans. They did the same kind of test where they showed black faces obscured by light and what lit up the amygdala. The amygdala. Now you know all about the amygdala. The monster. The amygdala monster is associated with fear. Fear. Good. Okay, persuasion. So commercials and stuff like that. What do you call the person who is um, speaking or giving the information? Source. The source. What about the person listening? The receiver. The receiver. What about what's said? The message. The message. What about how it's said? The channel. Okay, like through radio or TV or uh, YouTube or whatever. Okay? All right. The source. What are some qualities that the source might, you know, have, should have? Credibility. Credibility. Trustworthiness. Expertise. Expertise sometimes, right? Like a toothpaste commercial, who do they have? Dentists, right? Um, aspirin commercials, they'll have doctors. The um, abcmouse.com, they have teachers, like kindergarten teachers and stuff. So that makes sense because we would be more likely to listen to them, right? If someone is um, credible, or trustworthy, we're gonna listen to them as opposed to someone who's shady, right? So when someone's like in a commercial and they don't seem trustworthy, you're gonna be like, okay, next. So, good. Okay. Um, what's more, what's more um, credible? A one-sided or a two-sided argument? Two-sided. Two-sided because it shows that they acknowledge the other side and then they kind of shoot it down. It's like counter-argument, right? Good. Persuasion techniques. When you give all the facts. Central. Central. When you use hot models. Peripheral. 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 Give me an example of peripheral. Carl's Jr. Carl's Jr. Good. Give me an example. Actually, give your partner an example of central. Go. Doesn't have to be a real one, but what would the commercial sound like? Let's say it's a commercial for a car. Oh, how many miles? Yeah, the mileage of the horsepower. Yeah. Yeah. Good, I'm hearing good things. Mileage, horsepower, stuff like that. Good. <laughs> Colors. Uh, I'm ready for the AP test. <laughs> give me the test right now. <laughs> Josh is ready. Okay, Just give him foot in the door. If you get your foot in the door, that means you offered something reasonable, so they let you put your foot in the door, right? Mm -hmm. So foot in the door, you offer something at a low, low price, and then you say for $5 more, you know, whatever. Okay? Door in the face, you offer something at a high, high outrageous price because they want to slam the door in your face. Okay, so these are like, you know, the ones at the kiosks and the Topanga Mall. Oh, oh $50, yeah. but for you, it's 20 right? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, low ball effect. It's when you work, though, because you're like... Lowball is like when you're lowballed, it's a very negative thing. It's like someone offered something to you, but it's totally not what you expected. Like it's not good. Okay? Like it's missing stuff. Or yeah. So so just think it's low. Like that was low of them. Okay? That that could be an honor for that. What was the example of the one with these like the iPhone when you went to the store? Oh, okay, so that was where I think that was door in the face because he asked for a no, lot. That was bait and switch. Wasn't oh, it? oh, oh, bait and switch because he said he didn't yeah. have the color. Yeah, because then he had oh, that yeah. color. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was kind of bait and switch. Yeah, Actually, kind I of. This one. I mean, it's technically I already came into the store, so they didn't really have to bait. Okay, bait and switch. So when you say we don't have this, have this one, but we have that this one. one. Good. Framing effect. Framing rhymes with. 
Phrasing. So the way you phrase it. So instead of saying, would you like to buy it? What How might you say? How many, would you, How many would you like to buy? What, what color, color do you want? Because then you can't be like, no. <laughs> what color do you want? No. <laughs> All right. Near exposure effect relates to the attract, you know, the attraction one. But um, I mean, it's kind of, the, it's really the same thing. So the more you See. are exposed, but use a different term, the more you see something the more you like it right so this is why you might have the same commercial appear like twice in a row you know how that happens yeah. Or, or, or just in really general, to get in it, but it's not companies like know that if they show a lot of commercials you know if they buy a lot of those time slots for their commercial that people are more likely to buy because they see it a lot and then they start liking it um, Reciprocity norm is different than reciprocity effect. Remember the mnemonic is it's normal, normal to, feel, to feel, guilty. feel guilty if someone gives you something. So reciprocity norm is when somebody gives you something like address labels or a small sample or a free pen or something and you feel guilty, guilty so you buy it. You buy it. Or you, you buy, you know, whatever it is they're selling. Okay? Not the pen. <laughs> you buy whatever it is they're selling. The laptop. Yeah. Why would it work like justification effort? So, like, you know how, like, if you were, like, in line for a good long time, you want to buy something? It's like the price change that they're willing to work with you? Um, Are you still willing to buy it anyways? Like, you bargained for one? No, it'd be like, you know, like, like, it's a like limited time only, so you wait until, like, a huge long line, and even though it's not really worth your time, just to buy it, but when that be, like, a tricky, so that is, yeah, but that's not reciprocity norm. It's not one of them. It's almost like implying that the, that the object is scarce, and so you want to get it before it runs out. It's not one of those. Yeah, I don't know if there's a term for that. Scarcity effect. Hmm? Yes, UCLA one, they send a dollar with a survey, or a two dollar bill with a survey, hoping you fill out the survey because you feel guilty that you just got a two dollar bill. I don't know. I'm you. An actual two dollar Thank bill, you. yeah. I really need this. <laughs> okay, classical conditioning. In chapter six, we're going to go way more in depth. It's kind of a cool chapter, actually. Um, all about learning. So classical conditioning is when you pair things together. Yeah, so you have like an object that you have no feeling toward, but then you have another object that there's this natural response toward. So like Pepsi and Beyonce. So Pepsi alone, you're like, whatever, you know, it's Pepsi. Yeah. Beyonce, you're like, whoa, Beyonce, right? And then if you keep pairing Pepsi and Beyonce, Pepsi and Beyonce, so then when you go to the market and you see all the Pepsi without Beyonce, you feel happy, happy. happy. like, oh, I need to buy it. Okay? That's classical conditioning with regard to advertising. Okay, you could also do it negatively. The commercials where they show people smoking out of their, the hole in their throat. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So, so it's supposed to make you feel like just kind of queasy and un uncomfortable. So the next time you see a cigarette, you should feel queasy and uncomfortable. Okay? Um, so classical conditioning can work in positive ways or in negative ways. We talked about it last chapter with um, taste aversion. Remember if you eat something at Panda Express and you get sick? Now just the look or smell of Panda Express you makes you feel nauseous and not want to eat it, okay? So it's a survival, uh, it's an adaptation so that we don't, you know, die poisoning. Yeah. So like, what is like you threw up after eating Chipotle, but then like two weeks later you ate Chipotle again? <laughs> if you threw up after eating Chipotle, but then two weeks later you ate Chipotle again, it's just determination. You come back. <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> Remember me. Remember <laughs> <laughs> when I threw up in your bathroom? Yeah. So wouldn't that not work? Well, no, yeah, no, it still would work because if you say they have that because they smoked, then why would you smoke? Right? But it'd be like more like their fault. Oh no, wait, it'd be like more about like fake. It's like their fault that they did it, so like just more phenomena. Like, <laughs> you people would use that, but then it still doesn't. That wouldn't. 
we are. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, I see what you're saying. You see the commercials and you're like, it's like tired of everything. Right. Yeah, yeah, I guess there's kind of an element of that, too. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, unconditioned stimulus is Beyonce. The new, in, initially the neutral stimulus was Pepsi. Now that it's paired, now once it, once you start responding to the Pepsi the same way, we say the Pepsi has been conditioned, meaning you learned. So through classical conditioning. So now the Pepsi is the conditioned stimulus. So even if you start responding to the Pepsi, it's still called the conditioned stimulus. The unconditioned, unconditioned means like natural, kind of, um, you didn't have to learn. Like bee sting, you don't have to learn to be in pain, right? It just it naturally happens when you get stung, right? So then the sight of bees, that you had to learn to be scared of. Understand? Well, if you watch someone else get stung, then you, then you could be scared, yeah. Like you watch someone else get stung and scream, that's near enough, yeah. All right, uh, awkward conditioning. Um, the, again, both of these will be studying in more depth in chapter six, so shortly after we get back. Chapter five is gonna be like two days, um, and we'll take a, a quick test, and then chapter six is all this stuff. So, um, awkward conditioning is when someone does something and they get a favorable consequence, think like reward, okay? We call it positive reinforcement. Are they more likely to do it again or less likely? More, more likely. likely, right? They do, so, like for example, you come to a study session and you get donuts and extra credit yeah. and you have so much fun. Are you more likely to come again in April? Yes. Yeah. March actually, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Of course it. laughs> um, March, <laughs> let's start in March. Um, the spring break ones, I'm not gonna do it during spring break. Usually I do but we're gonna be going on a trip, so I, so I won't, which a lot of you guys go on trips too, so it probably works out. Usually I don't get good attendance on spring break ones anyway. Okay, so um, I know you guys are looking at me like, just deal with the final now. I don't wanna worry about that right now. <laughs> I can really. Okay, so if you do something and you get rewarded, you're probably gonna do it again. If you do something and you get punished, theoretically you're not, not gonna do it again. Chipotle, apparently. Um, <laughs> observational learning. Um, you learn by observing, by watching. So who are some people you learn from? Parents. Your parents, for sure, right? Your friends, maybe your teachers, if they're cool. Celebrities, right? Anything like that. Good. Okay. Central, oh, uh, no. That's not what I want this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Central route versus peripheral route to persuasion. Which one results in a longer lasting attitude change? Central. Central. When you give the facts about something, you're more likely to be committed to that product, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to like Carl's Jr. Like, yeah, someone might be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to Carl's Jr. Maybe I'll see that girl. <laughs> Probably not. But, um, you know, if it's something that gives you like, like, let's say there's an advertisement and they talk about the fact that it's grass-fed beef and that the, you know, lettuce is very fresh and, I don't know. You might be more likely to go to that restaurant more, right? Because you, you're, you know the facts. So, the fact that central route is last, uh, sorry, results in a longer lasting attitude change than peripheral is called the elaboration likelihood model. And if you think about it, the central route you're elaborating about the product, right? You're, you're giving a lot of facts about the product. So elaboration likelihood model says that central route lasts longer, the attitude change lasts longer than the peripheral route. Is that clear to everybody? What is it called again? Elaboration. It's, you know what? Akimi, it's right up there in gray. Oh. Okay, elaboration likelihood model. Sometimes I don't notice that because it's in gray. Yeah. Yeah. I know. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, obedience. When you when you comply to authority orders, direct commands from an authority authority figure. Okay, so who was the guy who did this experiment? Milgram. Milgram. It was Milgram. Okay, grams of shock. Good. So Milgram, remember, um, learned about the Nuremberg trials and the fact that all these Nazi soldiers who were tried one by one just kept saying, I was just following orders, orders and he kind of wanted to look into that, right? Um, the video I showed you, remember, he's, he shows himself at like a barber shop getting, um, I don't know, his beard like cut or whatever, <laughs> whatever shaped. Yeah. And, um, and so he's like, you know, in this situation, I'm willing to expose myself to, so just different situations, and then at the dentist with the drill, so you're willing to just listen kind of thing, almost because it's an authority. Like, would you just let anyone no. drill your teeth? No. So, um, so Milgram did that study. Once again, there was an accomplice uh, who was the one who was pretending to be shocked. The subject was the... What do we call that person? The teacher. Remember, the subject was the teacher, the accomplice was the learner. Remember? And so the subject would have to read the words, and then the learner, the accomplice, would have to give the matching word, and on purpose gave the wrong one, and then the subject would have to shock them, but we know that the shock was not real. Okay? Um, good. And so, what percentage of people went all the way to the highest shock? 65. 65% went all the way to the highest level of shock, which shows that people obey and do things that they normally would not do. Why? Because it's an authority figure, but where are they, Where does the blame go? On them. It's not on me. I didn't, you know, I was just following orders. The blame is on them. Okay? What was the one thing that lowered obedience? The, the presence of a dissenter. So remember they did different versions, and one of them they had different teachers in all in one room, but really only one of them was the subject. And so one of the accomplice teachers stood up and said, no, I'm not doing this. So then the subject was like, I'm not doing it either. Okay, so presence of a dissenter, which shows you bullying, you know, anything like that. It takes one person to stand up to it, and then, you know, other people will probably join you. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember one time I blazed off Really? Yeah, I kept one. Okay, here we go. Cool. All right, then we have Zimbardo. Ooh. Ooh. The, yes. You got the real, the real flame. Milgram <laughs> yeah. was like, thank you, God. <laughs> and then left. <laughs> yes, Milgram was very, you know, uh, relieved that the heat was now on Zimbardo. So, okay, well, before that, sorry, why was Milgram criticized? Because it was unethical. It was unethical. Because it was unethical, because what did it create? Cognitive dissonance. I'm a good person, I would never hurt anybody, I would have just killed somebody. Mm -hmm. Dissonant. Okay, I'm sure people, some people resolved it, but other people probably were left with dissonance, you know, and that's why he got criticized. All right, Zimbardo, how many boys? 24. 24. 12 We're prisoners. guards, 12 prisoners. Good. Okay, um, where was it? Stanford. Stanford. Stanford Prison Study, basement of the psychology building. They turned into a prison, a mock prison, and the guards were told that they just were not allowed to physically, like, basically hit the, the people, okay, the prisoners. Um, the guards were given a uniform, reflective sunglasses, a club, and a whistle. The prisoners were given a robe with a number. Why a number? Dehumanizing. Dehumanizing. Um, good. And they had like a chain on their leg too. I don't, I don't know if I mentioned that in all the classes, but. Okay, so um, what ended up happening? They went crazy. Uh, they went yeah. guards So the guards became hard. very Abusive, abusive, right? And even though they couldn't hit them, they did other things. They deprived them of food and Sleep. and warmth yeah. and bathroom privileges, and they um, they yeah basically sexually kind of harassed them and made them do things that they were very uncomfortable with. They turned they tried to turn them against each other. They put them in solitary confinement. Yeah. 
So yes, so the glasses, because they were reflective and they couldn't see the eyes, so it kind of took away their identity a little bit, yeah. And when people just do things because they're now part of a group and they're no longer kind of, like they lose themselves, their self-identity, and they become, what is it called? Dehumanized. De-individuation. De okay. yeah, De-individuation, okay? All right, good. So how many days did it last? Six days. Six days, and then who convinced him to stop it? His girlfriend, who later became his wife and is still his wife. Um, so yeah, um, and again, that shows that Zimbardo kind of got lost in the the power of the situation. So so all in all, you know, it was, it was a really good study because not only did the subjects get kind of affected by the power of the situation, but even the experimenter did. Um, I mean, which wasn't good, but you know, it just shows the power of the situation. So the whole thing with the Stanford, Zim the uh, Zimbardo Stanford Prison Study, is it really shows the power of the situation, situation and the influence of social roles. roles. Social roles, meaning we believe a prisoner acts this way, so we act that way. We believe a guard is supposed to act that way, so we act that way. Okay, any questions? Okay, so that's it on, um, well, the only other thing, obviously they were criticized because um, there was more than moderate mental discomfort, right? And people had breakdowns and stuff. Okay, group psychology, we're almost done with this chapter. So group psychology, when you are in a group, what happens to the responsibility? Each individual it goes lower because it's now shared among the whole group. So when you are alone, what percent responsible are you? 100%. 100%. When you're with two people, if it's you and one more, two people. 50. What about now you have four people? 25. 25. Good job. So the more people there are, basically, the more your responsibility declines. And this helps to explain something called the bystander effect, which says, People are less likely to provide. The more people around, the less likely, less likely, less likely an individual will help in a, you know, usually like a crisis type situation, all right? Um, so this explains the Kitty Genevieve's situation where, you know, 37 or 38 people heard her screaming and nobody called the police until it was too late. Okay, um, this explains why, you know, sometimes when there's a fight, nobody steps in to help. Um, when something drops on the ground, no one picks it up, because everyone's kind of like, hey, like, wait, wait, is someone else gonna do it? Okay, so bystander effect. Social loafing, what's the mnemonic? Loafers, up on the table. The more people there are, the less, the less effort each individual puts in, okay? That's why I'm not crazy about group projects, okay? Right? Because that is kind of what happens, unfortunately. Social loafing. So productivity goes down, group coordination goes down, um, and generally you're not working as hard as you should. Group polarization, what's the key word in here? Polar. Polar, so you have opposite extreme views. So this is when there's already, so a group um, already has kind of a dominant view. So for example, a jury, they go into deliberation kind of feeling the person's guilty. And then after talking, what happens to their view? It becomes stronger. It becomes even more polarized is the idea. So if they're already leaning toward guilty, by the end they say, definitely, definitely guilty. Right? If they're kind of leaning, leaning toward not guilty, by the end of it they say? Not guilty. Not guilty. So he's definitely not guilty. Yes? So it's not the same thing. That does happen, um, but it's different. This is specifically about a group. Like, so, so the group already has an opinion, and that opinion gets stronger. It doesn't explain, like, one person. Yeah. Okay. 
group think. Group think, what's the mnemonic? You don't think. So in a group, what happens to critical thinking? It goes, goes out the window, right? So in a group, we are less likely to think critically and we make a hasty decision. Hasty, decision. hasty means quick. quick. Remember one of the words on the test just the other day was hasten? It's yeah. to make faster. Okay, haste means quick, quickness kind of. Any questions on group think? Okay, um, once again, Dissenter, you know, well, with this one, sometimes dissenters don't speak up, so then everybody assumes they agree. They take silence as though they must agree. Okay, so group think, you make a hasty decision. Um, illusion of unanimity because dissenters don't speak up. Sometimes when people speak up, other people squash them down. And that's that. Okay, last slide. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling prophecy. What's a prophecy? A prediction. A prediction. And if you are self-fulfilling it, so what you're is that? Making it. You're making it. You're making it happen. So self-fulfilling prophecy is when you make a prediction about your future and you unconsciously end up making it happen. Okay? So if you start out of class saying, oh, I know I'm going to fail this class anyway, and then you do things like not show up, you don't really study, you don't fail. Okay? Got it? Okay. All right, so take a five-minute break.